We we are we are going to finish up John chapter eight. Are you sure? I am sure. <laughs> One way or the other. Might be five o'clock. We're going to okay. finish it. No, we're, we're going to finish it before the by myself. I'll often say you go go visiting places to speak. You, you ask the pastor like, well, how long do I have to speak? You can talk as long as you want, but the people leave at noon. <laughs> like, okay, I got it. So we'll, we'll, we'll figure it all out. So, so we are, we are going to finish. We're wrapping up John eight, and we're going to deal with the fact that, that it, within John eight, we've ran into a number of assaults on Jesus. Ten times in this chapter, the religious leaders will have come at Jesus, attacking him, assaulting him. And this is all coming from the leaders of Judaism. And it's not just this chapter. They were making the same blasphemous threats in the previous chapter and having the same desire to kill him there. And it goes all the way back really to chapter 2. When he started this ministry in Jerusalem, he walked in and did what? He cleared out the temple and made it known what he thought of temple operations and how wicked and wrong they were. And so they've been looking to kill him since then. So two and a half years have gone by, and you can imagine that it is kind of amped up. The, 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 the attacks have just kind of grown, and, and we're going to look at kind of how those play out as we, as we dig in a little bit this morning. It's been nothing but conflict ever since the beginning. So Jesus, let me say this, Jesus purposely antagonizes his adversaries because it's necessary. And I'll say that again. Jesus purposely antagonizes his adversaries because it is necessary. We're going to cover why that's necessary. We'll see it as what the truth does to error. It's required. He comes as the truth, as the light. It has to bump into where there's error and where there's not truth. There's no way for them to just coexist. He didn't come as the light and the truth to not drive out the darkness. He came to drive out the darkness. He came um, in, in every which way to, to combat the errors of things that are. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And he's run into that which has been a part of something completely opposite and, and different. In the bigger context, have you noticed that it's only evangelical biblical Christianity that, that is being persecuted? Hindus aren't being persecuted. The Buddhists aren't being persecuted. The Muslims aren't being persecuted. The Mormons aren't being persecuted. And, and on down that list kind of goes. And you go, well, why is that? Well, they're all false religions. And all false religions are part of the same kingdom of darkness. A house divided itself can't stand. So Satan makes sure that his house doesn't be divided. Those things aren't going to come under attack. The only one that's going to come under attack are the things that are about Christ and about God and that are of the truth and that, that combat the things of the enemy. And so, so you have, we were in First Peter this morning, he tells us that if we're his, these things are going to happen to you. You're going to suffer. You're going to go through. He tells us not to be shocked when those happen. They're going to happen. We live in a world that is not his at this point. One day it will belong to Christ. One day he will redeem it all. But in the meantime, it belongs to the prince of the power of the air. And he does what he wants to do. And so we'll, I mentioned this morning that uh, Elizabeth Warren, I, I saw a thing. She, she said that all of the crisis pregnancy centers should be shut down because they trick women into carrying their babies. That's just like... They, they reveal truth to these women. They show an ultrasound that shows this very human growing thing inside of them. They, they help them then financially and otherwise. But that's the view of somebody that's in darkness. That's the view of somebody that doesn't value life, that doesn't see the things of God. And so we shouldn't be shocked. It's also accurate to say the greatest enemies of the truth have always been those who are the most religious. It doesn't come from just the atheist so-and-so over here. The greatest attack comes from folks who are very religious. Satan has always been religious, and his false religion assaults the truth. It's a sign we're doing something right to have the kingdom of darkness coming after us. 
it is a sign we're doing something right to have the kingdom of darkness coming out. So the enemy does not want to lose his control in this town. Nothing that's happened to us in my shop. Mm -hmm. So Satan has had his strongholds in different places, in different ways, from religious people. You know, I'm convinced the more I've spent time with don't really know him. Again, I'm not the judge. And we're going to see, see an important part of that, is that they're not the enemy, they're the mission field. Mm -hmm. But the hearts of human attacks on Jesus didn't come from the people. He got indifference from the people for sure. But the real harsh, aggressive assaults on him came from the religious establishment. And the people that were the most devoted to that establishment. It is the ones running an apostate Judaism that come after him the hardest. All self-righteous Jewish leaders who were part of an apostate view of Judaism that belonged to Satan like all other religions. All other religion is part of the kingdom of darkness. We kind of get that. I know we're in a world that says, well, no, everybody can, you just have a view of God however you want, and then we're all right. But that's not what this says. That, that leaves Jesus as being just one of many options. I said before, if, if Heavenly Father sends His Son to go through what Jesus went through, and there's some other way, I don't want anything to do with that Father. If you grew up around a neighbor and they did this to a son, and you find out that wasn't necessary, you'd stay away from that family as far as you can stay away from them. But if, on the other hand, this is the only way, then, then, then we've got to cling to it. Jesus is it. Which means everything else is false. That came up one time in a football Bible study. I had a young man afterwards, and we just laid out the gospel and what Christ had done for us, and he was teary-eyed. Big tight end. And I grabbed him after, no one else was around. I said, what? Something's bugging you, what is it? And so I just come to the reality is that my dad died not knowing Jesus. He's in hell. I didn't have anything to give him. It's like, other than those that you love that are still here now, you have opportunity to share this news with. But you're not wrong if he never came to Christ. Now, none of us know what could have happened at the last moment, but... But you're right in knowing who he was and what he believed, that if he died in that, no, he, he didn't. And I get why that makes you sad on the one hand. On the other hand, that ought to drive you to make sure everybody that's around you knows that. That you would be the biggest voice piece of sharing the hope of Christ that there ever was. Because you wouldn't want that to happen to anybody else. But Satan wants to continue to come at us. He's an enemy of the truth enemies of Christ, then who is true? All religion claims to represent God, but it actually represents the devil. It represents Satan. And that's what Jesus said in verse 44. That was last week. But, but it's their response in 48 we're going to get to. So he says in 44, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Essentially says, you lie and want to kill me because you're part of the kingdom of darkness, and the kingdom of lies wants to stamp out the truth. And Jesus just very plainly told them that. So here's Jesus saying the most volatile things he could say to Jewish leaders. They pride themselves in being children of Abraham, being children of God, those who rightly represented God, they're God's agents to the world. And he says, you're of your father the devil. That is Judaism in its most devout form. It is satanic. I know we get caught up in a Judeo-Christian deal. Yes, we, we, we come out of the same. But when Judaism never receives Christ for who he is, then it's not true. We hold to our Old Testament for sure, but, the, but as they continue to look for one to come, not believing the Messiah ever came, they need to receive Christ. Until they do, they're following a lot. Do I want us to continue to support them in the Middle East? Yes, I do. Do I want to see God come back and redeem many of them? Yes, I do. And I believe that, that a lot of that will happen. 
But in its form right here, as it comes against Christ, it was of the devil. He says, you are of your father the devil. That is Judaism. Our Lord's combination of these leaders reaches a pinnacle in the final week of Jesus' life. So that's in Matthew 23. I'm going to read just a little bit out of that. It got referenced in Sunday school this morning, too. In his final week, he, he comes up against this crowd and says some incredibly harsh things. Not that what we just read wasn't harsh. But down in verse 13, there's a whole lot of, but woe to you. You're going to woe to them. That's not a good thing. When, when God's word says woe to you, there's, there's judgment and, and, and you're on the wrong side. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut the kingdom of heaven and people's faces for you. Neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you travel across the sea and land to make single to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of the devil as yourselves. How'd you like to have that said to you? are a religious leader. You think you're on top of your game, on top of the deal. And Jesus has just said, yeah, you, you, you save one. You save them and then make them twice the devil as even you are. You hypocrite. He's going to go on and on. Woe to you, you blind guides. He's going to say, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, verse 25. Hypocrites, for you clean the outside of my cup and plate, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may be clean. They're all about their outward appearance and works. Verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and uncleanness. So you outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocr hypocrisy and lawlessness. I could go on, but well, you get the gist there. <laughs> she just kind of in that last week just had enough. And let him know. Again, we're going to see he didn't do that out of hate. He didn't do that to, to crush them. He did it for another. Jesus denounces all of them and warns the people to stay away from them was the end of that week. Well, this growing two-and-a-half-year conflict we're in here today in this text with religious leaders was necessary as Jesus continues to confront their damning instruction with the truth. There were a whole lot of lost people that were surrounded and influenced by those religious leaders that needed to hear the truth. He's also got a heart for them, too, and gives them opportunity to respond. Somebody might say, well, back off. <laughs> I know as we went through some things next door, there, there, were, there were some meetings, and I, I felt bad for some of my deacon friends that sat in some of those meetings. And I think there may have even been times where it was thought, Chuck, you could, you could make peace with this. But there was not peace to be made with what was an error. It wasn't possible. Yeah, we could have kept together what would have been wrong. We could have kept together and not spoken truth. But there wasn't any way just to appease everybody. The truth of the gospel doesn't make everybody happy and hold hands at the end. Only those who truly belong to it. And it's offensive to all those who don't. And, and so here I think many are, I mean his disciples had to be thinking, really? Because who had they looked up to prior to Christ? The religious leaders. They aspired to be them. And weren't able intellectually. They became fishermen and tax collectors and other things. But they were, they were the top of the system that they knew and understood for their lifetime. And Jesus just come at it and said, no, they're wrong. They're in error. They're, they're hypocrites. And so he won't back off. The truth damns. And it damns eternally. It ultimately sends people into hell forever. That's what the truth does. In the meantime, it looks to redeem people. But it's ultimately the truth set against that which is false. And you're either in the truth with God or you're not. So the consequences are incalculable and they don't ever change. Error must be confronted with truth. These children of Satan then see Jesus as an enemy, as a disturber, a blasphemer, a lawbreaker. They can't contain themselves in dealing with him. They're so full of fury at him. It ultimately culminates in today's text. So verse 48. Remember verse 48 is going to begin with them having just heard what we read in verse 44. That he's called them the devil and the children of their father the devil. And so we pick up verse 48. The Jews answered him. 
Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me, yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. We're going to come back to all this. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died, and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old. And have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. We're, we're, we're at a culmination point here. The co conflict hits a high point. Either they repent and believe, or they kill him. They, 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 they've got two options. They're that upset. But he's either got to die, or, or they got to believe. The conflict's got nowhere else to go. Their hearts are hard. They're full of fury and rage. So why again does Jesus elevate this conflict? Why, why go there? Why, why push it to this point? Why does he raise it to this level? Why does he say things like, your father the devil? you got to know that's bringing a reaction, right? You are liars and murderers, and you desire what the devil desires. Why does he say that? Part because it's true. <laughs> it's truth that he's speaking to them, right? Mm -hmm. um, now the answer is ultimately though because he loves them. The answer ultimately he says it to us because he loves them. Because it is a mercy. It is mercy to shatter false securities. Mm -hmm. It is a mercy to devastate false religion. It is a mercy to strip people locked in some form of religious deception. To strip them naked of that deception. They're living in a lie. And they need to be rescued. Lovingly, what option do you have? To speak truth. To try to strip them of all that. To have them so shocked by that that they ultimately will repent and turn from that. But if you just go on ignoring it and propping them up, will they ever turn from that? Well, they won't. So in his love, he, he comes at them. They are the people with the emperor's clothes. They need to be exposed by the truth, exposed for what they are. Their false religion needs to be dealt with in a very strong, stern confrontation. Again, most of us don't want to have that confrontation. We just um, make everybody happy. But if I hold what is true, say I have the cure for cancer. And you as my friend sitting out there have stage four cancer and need what I have. What lengths, if you were me, would you go to to make sure you took that? You'd do any and everything to make sure they took that. Because it's the truth of what they need to heal. With. Jesus is doing just that. Right? In love, he is bringing them all barrels to bring before them truth to try to get their attention. Again, we said God's got to move in our heart for them to hear it. And Christ knows that God's got to move for them to hear this, but it doesn't change the fact He's got to speak truth and to speak into it. So we just back off a minute just to get an idea and framework for this passage. And debates, when they're lost, deteriorate to four levels. So a debate starts at an intellectual level. I think something's true, you think something's true, and we begin to debate that back and forth, right? So it's at a nice intellectual level. We're going along just fine. But now you have a disagreement. When you approach your disagreement intellectually on a mental level, here's my proof of why I believe it. You might give your proof why you believe it. But it brings up the first conflict level. Because we can't both be right. It's a debate. Our world just wants to make everybody happy. And so we say, you're right and I'm right. We all know deep down that's not possible. You had math class, right? 
Do you argue two plus two is five? I believe it's five. Mm -hmm. Keep on believing, it's still an F. <laughs> Good luck in life, believe in that is five. You won't have trouble everywhere you go, right? There, there are certain things that simply are true or they're not. Well, it moves from that level though, the progression goes from intellectual to emotional. Because now we start to get angry, right? And now we start to realize I can't get you to see my side of it. This is some of the meetings we had in at a leadership level in the last church that, that escalated to some places. They escalated quickly a few times. <laughs> like, wow, that, that, that got away fast. It wasn't, it wasn't from our side. This is where you start getting angry. You can't get your point across. You can't move the other person. The other person doesn't like what you said because they don't like the implications of what you said. They don't buy into what you said. The heat begins to rise. So we went from intellectual and emotional and thirdly, verbal abuse. When you can't make your argument, you're angry, you just start firing off at the mouth. And we sat through some of those meetings. It's like, wow. I had no idea that kind of anger was possible out of you, but there it is. And accusations start being made. And epitaphs and calling people names. And we've lived through some of that. Suddenly around town, all kinds of things start being said when they haven't got what they want. And again, I don't mind bringing this up because we're going to get to the fact that, again, they're not the enemy at that point. They are the mission field. But that's exactly what you see here in the fourth and final step. So you went from intellectual to emotional to verbal. And the last one is that it just gets us to, to physical. You can't win the argument. Ultimately, you just deck the guy. <laughs> see it on the athletic field, right? Baseball coach comes out with an argument. <laughs> Umpire doesn't like it. He gets tossed. Now I got to get my money's worth on the coach. <laughs> Been tossed anyway. Now it's time to start picking bases up and throwing them, emptying the dugout, kicking dirt. You know, you're not allowed to bump or touch the umpire because the fine comes with that. But now you just start start losing it in every other which way, and off it goes. Now they actually have things in college baseball where you can review a play. <laughs> So that keeps the escalation from going. We'll, we'll pull out the cameras and see, hey, maybe maybe I did make a mistake. I mean, we're going to ruin games by taking human elements out of it, but it's those conflicts we're trying to avoid. Well, Jesus is going to go through that. And, and in here, so this is what happens. This group of religious leaders start with an intellectual discussion. They can't win. They're speaking to the truth. They're speaking to the one who's all truth, without any errors. They're never going to win an argument with him. He says they're wrong, they ought to just accept, well, please help them, show me how to get right. I realize that, that's not in them. It shows that they're incompetent. They descend to the emotional level where they become angry and bitter. All they can think about is getting rid of him, killing him, and move to verbal level where they all begin to call him a demon and a Samaritan. Chapter 10, they call him insane. At the end of this chapter, they're moved to physical abuse, they pick up stones, and ultimately it's going to lead them to crucify as we see this play out. They couldn't win the argument. In the face of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, they are infinitely incompetent. They're exposed. They're uncovered. They're deeply... Their depravity is demonstrated. They don't have the truth, and they can't stand against the truth. And they start descending to lower and lower levels till they have rocks in their hands and murder in their hearts. They are stripped down and left undone. And can I say that it is necessary? It is necessary. Stripping them bare of the emperor's clothes is necessary. They need to be aware that they are under judgment and condemnation. That's ultimately what Jesus is going to tell them. Without a change, you're under judgment. You're dying. You sit under the wrath of God where you sit right now. And in love, I'm telling you everything I possibly can to move you off of that spot. Again, we do this because it's the most loving thing Jesus... And again, why did he do this? Because it's the most loving thing Jesus could possibly do. Again, they are not the enemy. They are the mission. We will disagree in large part with the world that's lost and doesn't know Christ. And our job is to love them and proclaim the truth. I mean, we look out for a fight every time we come out the back door. But we've got to speak truth and live truth out. 
So there's three phases we're quickly going to look through in this passage. Each kind of section. First comes blasphemy from them. Jesus then speaks truth. And then Jesus gives a gracious invitation. So in the first one we have several verses. There's blasphemy, truth, gracious invitation. The second one, blasphemy, truth, gracious invitation. Well, the third and last one, there's blasphemy, and then there's truth. And well, we'll have to see how that one ends. Because he doesn't really get a chance to give an invitation. Because at that point, they're so in fury and outraged that it doesn't move on. So love destroys false securities. Love doesn't leave people alone in their false religion. It's why we can never turn these people into the enemy. But must remember that they're in the mission field. It's what truth does. should move us to love. So they may be persecuting you at work, or at school, or on the job, wherever else, but they are the mission field. So when you get blasphemy from them, you respond how? In truth, which is the loving thing you can do, and with a gracious invitation. When they come at you, and they will, we've got to remember to respond, certainly in love, but in truth, and with a gracious, same way Jesus did, in truth and with a gracious invitation. It doesn't mean we change our view, we speak truth. And they might not like your view. So they may continue in what they're about. God is just. God one day will bring judgment and will end all of that. But in the meantime, we've got to come. So here, here we go. Jesus goes at their false beliefs of religion to leave them exposed. So phase one is verses 48 to 51. So in verse 48, again, was a response to 44. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? There's their blasphemous accusations. You're, you're demon-possessed. You're a Samaritan. Why are they throwing the Samaritan? Well, Samaritans were hated by the Jews. Go back to 2 Kings 17, I believe it is, when the northern kingdom was taken over. Those that were left behind that were Jews intermarried with a lot of the pagan groups that had come in and taken over. So they were considered half-Jews or compromised Jews. They were a mixed breed. And so they're constantly <coughs> accusing Jesus of, of that. Interesting. Now the woman at the well was what? <laughs> Samaritan. And in that town, what happened? Many came to believe in chapter 4. And some of our first, for sure, converts to, to Christ happened in that town. Um, I don't think he even was offended that they called him that. But they thought they were throwing hateful things at him when they said it. So then he speaks truth in verses 49 and 50. He says, I do not have a demon. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Are we not wrong in saying it? No, I don't have a demon. But I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Jesus came not in his glory, right? What did Jesus Jesus had given up all his glory? Philippians 2, that he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. He humiliated himself, taking on the form of a man. And not just that, ultimately death. And death how? Death on a cross, which was only for murderers and thieves. And he accursed. So, so Jesus, now does Jesus get glorified in the end? Well, heavens, yes. God glorifies. God Raises his name to be above all names. And God sits on the right hand and on the throne. But when he came, he came not to glory in himself. But did the Father glorify him? Yes. God has affirmed him all through Scripture and has affirmed him with John the Baptist. He's going to affirm him at the Mount of Transfiguration. He's going to affirm him everywhere that we look. Heavens, he's clearly God's Son. And to denounce Christ is to denounce the Father. So they can't say they know God and then to talk that way about Christ. They're together. They're, they're one. And so he has spoken truth. Here's the gracious invitation in verse 51. Truly, truly. And again, the truly, truly, we have 25 times in the book of John. It's, 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 when we finish praying, we say what? We say the word, Amen. And we affirm, like we, we at the end say we affirm what God has said, what he's about. We say amen to that truth. God that says in the beginning when he speaks says amen, amen. He <clears throat> affirms it before he's ever said it because he's always true and he's always right. 
and this is new information. And so we get this truly, truly, hey, I need you, said before it's kind of coach talk, the whistle blows, I need your eyes. What I'm about to say isn't just nonsense. Like, this is going to happen in the game today, and I need you to be ready and aware of it. And so 25, so a few of them. John 8, 34, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. I have a warning. John 6, 53, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Remember, we covered that one. 10, 1, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, he does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way. That man is a thief and a robber. Don't worry, I'm not reading all 25. But 10, 7, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Can't wait to get to chapter 10. John 5, 24, we had a big verse. Essentially the gospel in one verse. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. It's back, passed from death to life. That's much the invitation we get here in verse 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Jesus is obviously not speaking physically here, right? Because even Jesus dies physically. But we're talking about spiritually. We move from being dead spiritually to being made alive in Christ for eternity with the Father. And do we have any fear of the second death? No, because we made his beloved sons and daughters. So, so those, those that he's speaking to, he's just invited that if they keep his word. Well, what's all involved in keeping his word? We've got to, again, believe him to be who he claimed to be. It, it is being filled with his spirit. It is obeying. There's a belief that moves to action. That it's not just a verbal saying. It's just not, I don't just affirm it and say it. And it's something that, that encompasses everything about me as I move forward. And that this book becomes something that I've got to continue to dig and, and, and feel through. You know, we talked about when the bracelets went around, I thought, well, that's kind of hokey, but what was behind it wasn't. What would Jesus do right here? And I'm his ambassador, I'm told in, in Colossians. It's Christ's ambassador that I go where he goes. I go in his stead. And so before you might be the only Jesus with skin on some ever encounter. Mm -hmm. So how you live life and how you do things will, will speak to them in certain ways. Mm -hmm. That's all that he's talking about wrapped up. You're facing judgment and death. But if anyone keeps or obeys my message, my word or gospel, they will not see death and get caught in it. I'm really talking about that death from Revelation 20 and 21, that eternal forever condemnation death. I've been around some that are afraid to die. You might have a fear of dying. It's put by one person one way. I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> I don't like, it's, like where I'm going, I'm not afraid of at all. How it happens, eh, yeah, that, I'd like a little more control in that than we have, right? I'd like the movie Grumpy Old Man, they're like, so-and-so died in his sleep. And they use some colorful language, lucky. <laughs> like, and that's kind of how we'd like to go. Just peacefully one night in my older age, I just lay down and I'm with Jesus. I'd rather not have the car wreck, or the heart attack, or the hospital scare, or this or that. Right? But that's not the death we're talking about here. We're talking about the ultimate judgment death. The believer's physical death is actually one that ushers us into joy and peace. Is it not? This one pastor tried to describe it. The lady just had surgery. So right before he had surgery, they put this little needle in this magic stuff in there, right? And you kind of got ushered. I can remember some have had three or four different orthopedic surgeries. And they hook you up. So you start to count back from 100, and you get to about 97, and you're... <laughs> Next thing you know, you're waking up in pain for where they've hammered and chiseled and screwed you back together. It's like, I liked it better when I was counting back from 100. <laughs> but we get ushered into the presence of Christ. That, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful thing. But more importantly, we don't see that physical death. Well, that was phase one. Phase two, verse 52, they jump right back in. They don't receive his gracious invitation. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets died, who do you make yourself out to be? So they just throw more blasts. Now we know you have a need. Who do you think you are? 
all these folks just think about how, how, how could you possibly make this come? Now we know you're nuts. So here's the truth in verses 54 and 55. Again, does, does Jesus chase them back with, with they revile Adam as he reviled back? Even on the cross he didn't do that. He told him Peter that, that Jesus never never he, he spoke calmly back truth, but he never never got caught up in a heated argument back and forth with these guys. They came at him and he would speak truth and a gracious invitation and would lead to more of their abuse and he'd give more truth. So here's some more truth. If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Now here's the gracious invitation following that truth. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. But Jesus essentially saying, wouldn't you like to join in with your father Abraham and rejoice at my coming? He rejoiced in it and was glad. Wouldn't you like to join him in that? How, how does all that play out? They, they think he's probably referencing most when when, Mo, when Abraham took Isaac up on the mountain and was about to plunge a knife into him. And what happened? God provided the sacrifice. Spared Abraham his son. And God had promised from your seed would come many nations. So he knew that either God was going to raise his son Isaac or that he was going to provide. And deep down, as much as that had to be the most ridiculous emotional turmoil to come to grips to hike up there alone with your son while uh, he carried the, the elements that ultimately you're going to strap into that was a promised child that didn't come till you were a hundred but he believed God of his word and I think God gave him the insight that, that one would be provided one day as the sacrifice that would be the final sacrifice of all time and that's what Christ is on our behalf the perfect lamb slain once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. And Abraham was able to look forward to that day and rejoice in it. He's inviting them to do the same. But we get to the final phase because they don't know what to do with him at that point. They are beside themselves. So the Jews said to him, you're not 50 years old. We're actually told his ministry began at 30. Maybe he looked over the map. Maybe they just threw out a term. I don't know. Dealing with them would have made me look 50. <laughs> if I was 30. Yes, I'm older than that now. I, already, I realize, yes, you folks, I already look older than 50. Thank you so much. Yet you're not 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? It's just a mocking. Like you're, you're not. I mean, this was forever ago. Hundreds of years ago. You're not even 50. What the heck are you talking about? You're just nuts. And Jesus said to them, and this is a truth that they really can't handle. Another, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. What did he just say to them? Before Abraham was, I was, did he say? No. I am, meaning he always was, meaning he had been there with God, part of God from creation, which is how John started, right? The beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. By him all things were created. So, so it's not new that this claim has been put on Jesus. But for them, they've literally just heard him say, I have always existed. Abraham looked forward to it because I was with him. I was with him when he climbed up there with Isaac. I was with him when we, we and the Father provided the sacrifice that was needed that day. And I am what he looked forward to. Well, that claim of God was more than they could handle there wasn't a gracious invitation after that. Essentially, there was a, a sense of, it's, it's over. They completely reject Jesus. Verse 59, so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the tent. What is time? Six more months, it'll be his time. He'll let them take him and they'll let them nail him on the cross. We have a similar thing where, where the folks, religious leaders, couldn't handle Stephen in Acts 7. He was brought in and he gives a sermon. 
And he lays out from the beginning of Scripture to the end. And they literally, it says, they are so full of fury, they're gnashing their teeth. <laughs> and they drag him out of the city and they begin to stone him to death. And who was with him on that day? Saul. Who would become Paul. That God would use to, to bring the hope of the gospel to so many of the Gentiles. In verse 59 of King James, it actually ends with the words, And Jesus passed by. For the religious leaders, it's as though I gave you invitation. I gave you truth and invitation, truth and invitation, and it continued, and now no more. I passed by. We're going to get to one of my favorite passages next week with the man born blind. Because as Jesus is passing by, that man sees physically and spiritually after the encounter with Christ. But this group right here, they miss the gracious invitation. So to us, don't miss the gracious, gracious invitation. Don't stay hardened. Don't let Jesus pass by. Be the other blind man that when he heard Jesus come and kept screaming for him and screaming for him. Everybody told him to be quiet. He said, no, bring him to me. Let us be found being the ones that cry out for that invitation. In John 9.39, I'm just going to skip us ahead just to read one verse. Jesus says this, For judgment I came to this world. And we say, wait a minute, I thought you didn't come to judge the world. You came to, yes, you did come to save it. But there comes a point where it has passed by. For judgment I came to this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. And we'll deal with those religious leaders who thought they could see. But have been blind all along. I can't say this to us. The gracious invitation hasn't passed us by. Mm -hmm. To those who may have seemed as your enemies, it hasn't passed them by yet. Mm -hmm. may, may we this week find ourselves mm -hmm. with those who you may know have said things. I'm not saying let's go hold hands and expect kumbaya on them. <laughs> Could happen one day. But we are called to speak truth and love. We are all called to continue to put in front of them a living, resurrected Jesus who is the only way, the only truth, the only hope that one has to avoid a final judgment coming. Do we know him this morning? Is, is he yours? Have you believed? His invitation in verse 51 was, was what? If anyone keeps my word, you will never taste it. What a promise. Are you sure of that promise this morning? Well, let me pray and we're going to bring the kids up. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you and love you. We thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the way that, that you continue to endure folks who continue to mock you and to put you down and continue to question you. You continue to speak truth and to invite. Lord, give us hearts to those that we know disagree that maybe even done hurtful, harmful things our way. Well, we looked this morning, if it, if it was because of our walk with you, then we're blessed in that. We should rejoice in that. Mm -hmm. If it's because we treat them badly, they speak badly, then, then may it not be. May we mm -hmm. repent and come right. May we have a love for those that you put around us in this world to, to do what you did, to speak truth and to extend the invitation of grace that you've given to us. May we love folks around us. Lord, may we love one another and build each other up and encourage each other and to be an encouragement in the midst of these things. May we not be shocked by anything that comes our way. But no, this isn't home. And there is a day coming when all that gets righted and all that goes away and we simply get to be in your presence forever and ever. Grab our hearts this week and all that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, come on, grab them. That group will be glad to get out of there. Sing one final song here. In our response, we respond through our giving. We respond by all means. Yes, we can hit that. Is that